Good morning, church. How are we doing? That's better than normal. Let's go ahead and stand. You know the routine. We're going to worship together. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Now satisfied here in your love. Every voice sing it. Oh, there's nothing you got. I like it. Let's keep it going this morning. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and thoughts. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's If you're happy to be here, clap your hands. If you're happy to be here, clap your hands. If you're happy to be here, then your face will surely show it. 
If you're happy to be here, clap your hands. Oh, we heard some of you clapping your hands. That worries me. But good morning, church. How are you? How are you? Good. The teens are good. Teens, come on up here. All the teens, come on up on stage. I need your help real quick. Come here. Don't be, a, I'm not going to make you do anything scary. Why do they always get so scared? Teenagers. So I'm going to give a quick announcement too because we're going to have an awesome announcement video here in a second. But as we begin, uh, I don't believe this is on. You guys can come all up. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. This isn't on our announcements because uh, this was just decided um, at the end of the week. Um, something incredible is going to be happening this summer. Daniel, get up here too. You can come up here. What do you guys think of Daniel's shirt? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Try to see if anybody else would back you up. Um, something incredible is going to be happening this summer. Do you know what it is? Church camp. Church camp. We haven't had church camp in like a bazillion summers, right? And so church camp this summer, and we're really excited. But guess what, church? In order for that to happen, they need your help. And so on May 16th, that's in just about a month, we have an incredible thing coming back called the Church Dessert Auction. All right? And so that's going to help us raise money for all of our kids and all of our teens. And I think, what? how many did we decide that it might be? Around 45 kids connected to our church that we're expecting to go to camp. Um, times 145, and it was a big number. All right? And so uh, it was like $7,000. And so that's going to be our goal to raise um, and so on May 16th, we're going to have uh, dinner together down there in the fellowship hall in the gym. And then we're going to be having a dessert auction as well to help raise that money for you guys so you can go to camp. You excited? <laughs> Which means we need you guys' help as well to do desserts. And so out on the um, front check-in desk, um, there's a sign-up sheet. Or you can sign up on one of the cards in the pew back in front of you, seat back. Um, that you'll be, I did say pew. That's really old, isn't it? <laughs> the seat back. Um, and if you would like to make a dessert, your famous dessert, whatever that is, Miss Kay, just pick one of your 30 incredible desserts and it would be perfect. Uh, Miss Kay makes the most incredible desserts, but um, we need your help to make that happen. And so if you can do that, sign up to make a dessert. Um, I'll probably make a couple. Um, usually one of them will turn out. Um, and so uh, May 16th, mark that on your calendar to stay after um, so we can send these happy, these happy teenagers to camp, all right? Parents, that means you get a week without your teenager, so that makes you happy, and your kids. And so it's going to be a great time. We're excited. We're excited to be here, yes? Yes, you guys love being on stage, yes? Are you guys ready to get off? Okay, that means we're going to meet and greet each other. Let's open in a word of prayer, and we'll meet and greet. Who wants to pray for us? Cammie? Cammy, would you would you pray for us, Cammy? Already did it. It doesn't matter. No. I'll give it back to Cammy. Daniel, since all your teenagers are passing us around like they're afraid, why don't you show them how it's done? Well, you pass it with confidence. God, Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to be together, God. I just pray that as we go into a time of worship and greeting each other today, God, that you would just be blessing each and every one of us and be transforming us to be more like you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right, let's meet and greet each other.
Welcome, New Day. We're the Thomas family, and I'm Evan Thomas. Fun fact about me, this church is my old preschool building. I went to preschool here a long time ago. Good morning, New Day. I am Brooke. I am wife to Evan and mom to Devin, Maverick, and Emily. My name is Devin Thomas. I own two classic cars, a 1963 Mercury Monterey and a 1978 Chrysler LeBaron. An interesting fact that most people don't know about me is I am an adventurous. I love rock climbing, four-wheeling, wave runners, all that good stuff. I am Emily, and one fun fact about me is that I am an animal lover at heart. And I have two pets at home. One is Lady Grace. She is my puppy, and she is a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel. And two, I have a Dexter the Turtle, and he is my lovable little Dexter. Wednesday night is Hype Youth and Kids Night. The youth and kids departments will combine together for an evening of games and Jesus. They will meet together in the sanctuary and the men group, men's group will meet upstairs in the youth room. Saturday, April 24th is Hype Afterglow at Brenda and Bill's house. We say Brenda's name first because, well, she's in charge. It goes from six to nine and we will be having a fun time together as you enjoy life on the farm. There may even be a cow patty throwing contest. Show up to find out. All aboard, whoop whoop. Vacation Bible School is coming up fast. It will take place the week of April 26th through 30th. Each night the church will open at 5.30 to come and eat and VBS will go from 6 through 7.30. Come join us as we jump on the rocky railway and journey with Jesus. This is for all ages up through fifth grade. If you are wanting to help with VBS, there will be a worker meeting after church on Sunday, April 25th. Head to the gym for pizza and info on how you can be a part. Summer camps for youth and children are happening this summer. So we are planning a dessert auction for the month of May. Be looking for more information on this incredible event as we support our young people. We are looking for people to make their best desserts and those to pray about how they can give and dig deep. We are gonna to try to send 30 youth and kids to camp this summer. As we get started into this next song, as we continue to worship together, um, we're going to have a time of um, giving of our tithes and offerings, and the men are going to be bringing those, or the ladies, I think I see some ladies back there, um, maybe some of the teens are going to be bringing the buckets around, uh, but we're going to continue to worship God as we give from our hearts um, with joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are thankful to be in your presence today, God. We're thankful for the way that um, you provide for us, provide for our families, God. And so we're thankful, God, and joyful that we get to turn around um, and place back into your hands all that you have given to us, understanding and recognizing, God, that in your hands it'll go much further. And so um, we pray that you'll continue to um, bless not just the gift, but the giver as well. It's your name we pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my my 
Wow, what beautiful words to listen to this morning, that we have a God that is never going to let us down, that we have a God that's always with us. You know, as that song was going on, my week just kept running through my mind. I was just thinking about everything else that has gone through my week. You know, it's been an average week. It's had its ups and downs, the things that have gone good and the things that have gone bad. But at the end of the day, I find that I have so much joy in my life, so much joy in my heart listening to that song because we have a God who's never going to let us down. Things are happening in each and every one of our lives. Every person in this room has something different that's going on. But the one thing that remains true for each and every one of us is that we serve a God that's never going to let us down. We serve a God that meets us in our brokenness, in our problems, in our struggles, and in our life. And that is something to have so much joy about. As we go into a time of prayer, I invite you to take whatever posture that you throw right. The altars are open, praying in your chairs are open, grabbing someone to pray with you is always open. And I just ask that today as we pray, that we would all invite God into our hearts and allow ourselves to listen to what he has to say. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes with me. God, Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to be gathered in your house this morning, God. Thank you for this opportunity for us to come together in this morning, talk about our lives, to hear what you have to say, God, to see what you're doing among your people, God. Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room today, God, that your Holy Spirit, your Holy Presence would come down and it would surround each and every one of us, God. And that as we hear what Pastor Chase has to say in a little bit, God, that these words wouldn't be something that just bounce off us, God, but these words would be something that we grab a hold of, something that transforms transforms us, something that changes our life, God. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't leave this building today and just be ourselves, God, but we would leave this building to be the church. God, I pray for whatever is going on in the lives of these people today, God. I pray for the person who's struggling, God. I pray for the person who's tired. I pray for the person who is struggling in their family life, God. I pray for the person that needs a break, God. I pray for the person who is rejoicing because of the amazing thing that you've done in their life this week, God. Lord, I just pray that today as we gather together, Lord, we would worship you, that we'd worship the God who saves, the God that changes, and the God that's never going to let us down. God, I pray that you would be with the person in here who needs you the most. In Christ's name, amen.
to share this platform with Bill this morning, as well as share time in God's Word with you. I will be reading from John 10, if you'd like to get your Bibles ready. For the year 2021, God spoke over me the word victory. It would be a word that I would study in depth in scripture, as well as walk out in faith. Over the years, our family has learned to walk out our faith well through the suffering. It is in the victory that God saw my faith needed to be strengthened. We are four months into the year, and I can honestly say I'm not there yet, but God is growing me. This past week, I couldn't sleep. As it was approaching the one o'clock hour, I found myself in conversation with the Lord. It was in that conversation, I came to a point where I asked God, how do I know it is you, Lord? How do I know it is your voice I'm hearing and not of my own making? Jesus lovingly and compassionately, but immediately responded, you are my child, you know my voice. Isn't God good? His loving compassion and kindness is never ending. It meets us in the highs, but it also meets us in our sorrows, in our troubles, and even in our moments of disbelief. His loving compassion 
is intimate and lavished over we, his children. As we look at John 10, the title of this passage is The Good Shepherd and His Sheep. Beginning with verse 3, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used the figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. God intends for us to live in the fullness found through life with him. A life given on the cross and yet raised in victory three days later. As children of God, we are his sheep. Therefore, we can trust in his voice when he speaks to us, just as we can trust in living a life through his fullness and victory. What victory is God calling you to trust in and walk in today? Friend, may we posture ourselves with confidence and believe in the promise set before us through his word. For we are his children and his children know his voice. I don't know if I have to preach. In Sunday school this morning, we were talking about God's call. That's what we've been talking about the last two Sundays in Sunday school. And, uh, you know, the, the question that we ended on today, how does, how does fear and God's calling go together? That, Brooke, that was a great answer to that question. I have a great story from the Bible this morning. We're going to have some fun reading it. Uh, Blake, I need you for a second. Come here, Blake. And I need, how many 15-year-olds do we have in the room? How many 15-year-olds? Caleb? Here, come here, Caleb. Come here, Caleb. You're 15. All right. Just you stand right here. Caleb, you stand right there. We're going to be talking about David and Goliath today. Yeah. So actually, I might need you at the back for, for this just real quick. I might need you at the back because you're going to be coming in in a second. I need a sword. I need a sword. Drumstick. Good call. I need a sword. And then I need a... Ah, I need a stone. All right, we got an egg. Here, someone take this back to Caleb. Here's his sword. Well, actually, this is your sword. You're Goliath. Here's a stone. Um, and we'll just pretend like you have a slingshot. We know this story, right? 
<laughs> For you it is, but you're Goliath, so it'll be fine. It's like a dagger. Just... So you're going to be acting out what is going on in the story, okay? <laughs> I love doing this to people. I was like, we're not even telling these people we're doing this. So, so David and Goliath, so everything in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 from basically uh, verse 1 all the way up until what we're going to be looking at today, so all the way up through verse 31 is Goliath taunting the Israelites. <laughs> Give it one of these. Give it one of these. Give it one of these. No, no, no you're not going to do that. Okay. All right, so, so he's taunting the Israelites, and he says things like, you're so weak. You, you have to say the oh, words. you actually want me? I thought, yeah, I, say it. You were telling the story now. You're so weak. Okay, me big, you small, weak. Boo. Okay. Also not very, ar- weak. also not very articulate. Yeah, very good. He yells a lot. He's a big guy. Yeah, and he, he, has, he has a shield carrier, so I need a shield carrier. Uh, yeah, come on up, shield carrier. Come here. So he has a shield carrier. So he has, Goliath is no different than any other big bully. He has a little lackey. So come here real quick. You're going you're gonna to have to carry. We'll pretend like you're carrying a shield. So you have a shield carrier, right? And so we get to verse 32, and this is what it says. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, if you want to go ahead and pull that up for us, Jared, it says... So David, so David, he's back there in the back, and he's hanging out, and uh, he, co- he goes to King Saul, and he says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll fight him. And Saul looks at him, and he says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Apparently, there's lions in the room, but David (laughs) persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal uh, uh, the lamb from, steal a, a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. You're just gonna act this out for me, aren't you? All right, well, good. You do the hand motions. You'll be David just for a second. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Cool, right? The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul finally considered. He said, okay. He said, go ahead, and may the Lord be with you. Because it doesn't say this in Scripture anywhere, but it says, and you know he was thinking, we won't be. <laughs> we'll be behind you. Then Saul, got, then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat, and David put it on. And do you guys remember what David said? Because David's not used to wearing this stuff, right? David put it on, and he strapped on the sword, and he, and he said, I'm not used to wearing this. I can't go in these. So... I'm not going to use them. So David took them off. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Here he comes. And Goliath. Goliath. Yeah, now, now you can go stand back here. Yes. So Goliath walked out toward David. With the shield bearer ahead of him, but we put him behind him, (laughs) sneering contempt at this young-faced boy, handsome, by the way. Ladies, he's single. (laughs) And Goliath says, verse 43, am I a dog? Next one. (laughs) That you come at me with a stick. Yes, and then he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine, okay, David. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies, the God of the hosts of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you. Give you the dead bodies of your enemies, to the birds and the wild animals, and to all the 
All right. And then after that sermon, the next slide. Oh, it is an exciting. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescued his people, but not with the sword or a spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to the attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Don't get too close, Goliath. Close to Goliath. He's, he's going to have to hit you with something in a second. But reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out one of the stones, he hurled it. Hurl it. It sank into Goliath's head. He stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David, triumphant, and everyone goes, woohoo, over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, run over, and pulled up Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him by cutting off his head. Whoop. He went with the saw approach. That's cool. That's cool. I would have swung it, but sure, yeah, sawing it. I mean, that takes more time. <laughs> but then we're not. And, and but then this is the part that I'm going to look at today most. After that, in the very next part of of chapter 17, the title is "Israel Routs the Philistines." We're going to talk about that in just a minute. All right, thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Everyone, give them a hand. Thank you for. So, so this story is so, there's so much in it, and it's fun to tell, obviously. Like, you, you could tell this story in kids' church without all the gore and stuff. And, but thinking about Goliath, and Goliath is this nine-foot-tall guy, and David's this little 15-year-old, probably like five-foot-five, five-foot-six, five-foot-seven. And you think about this big ogre-ish guy standing over David telling him he's going to peel the skin off his body and feed it to the wild animals and the birds. And I mean, I'd be terrified if I had somebody, like if I had Stephen Adams standing over me telling me this, the same kind of things that Goliath was saying to David, I'd be terrified. I'd be terrified. You know, uh, the interesting part to the story about David and Goliath is, is Israel actually, like a lot of times in scripture, did not go until somebody moved. Like somebody had to get over the fear right? So leading up to this, what I was talking about earlier in verse 1 all the way through verse 31, it is time and time again, Goliath coming out taunting, wanting somebody to step forward to fight. And there was literally nobody in the entire Israelite army who was ready to step forward to do this. Now, we could argue that uh, God played a role in that because he knew exactly what he wanted to do with David. Or we could also argue the fact that God needed David because God knew exactly what the Israelite army was going to do and how they were going to respond. But even in the midst of all that, God knows how all that's going to play out, right? But there is something very significant taking place in this story. There is very much a call to action. There is a call to action at, for somebody but one of the reasons why David had to do what he did was, was because nobody else was willing to work through their fear. Nobody else was willing to step out and say, I will fight this giant. I want to ask you a question about this story. So in David and Goliath, what if, what if David stepped out and in one fell swoop, Goliath killed David? What if that happened? What if things were different. What if David would have stepped out and Goliath killed David? What if, what if that happened? And then what if, do you think Israel would have moved forward? Do you think the end of that verse would have said the same thing, that Israel takes down the Philistines? Do you think that, do you think that that would have happened had David not had won? You know, it's interesting. I I think about my life, and I think about the way that God has called me, and uh, I, uh, I always, I, I, I try to reach for this idea that, that God's plan for me is always clear, and I, and I always hope for that, but God's plan for our lives is not, we don't always see it clearly. We, we question it sometimes. Your group was talking about that this morning. There's not always this clear response. There's not always this clear answer. A story I want to tell you. So 
I had a best friend growing up. His name was Chris. And Chris and I, we would play baseball together. And some of you know this story. There's this big bay window in his house. And this bay window, had a, it, it holds a lot of significance to me. In fact, every time I drive by that house, I'll drive by it from time to time. And I look at that window, and it, it holds great meaning to me. And, and I tell you that story, that part of the story, to get to the next part of the story, that when we were eight years old, we were playing baseball in our front yard, and uh, we got bored because it was just the two of us, and it's hard to play baseball with just two people, and because really at that point, it's just kind of like a home run derby. Well, we lost the three tennis balls that we were using, and we found a golf ball in the flower bed. And I told Chris, I said, how far do you think I could hit this golf ball with this metal bat? And he was like, oh, I don't know probably down the street, and I started looking down the street, and I was like, yeah, there's a lot of cars and stuff in the way, but we knew, like, right behind us, there was this big field. It was uh, owned by Mr. Burleson. He had, like, three or four acres, and there was nothing really to hit back there as long as I cleared Chris's house. Well, I stepped up, and, and I took a big swing at this ball, and, I mean, I topped it, and I just hit a line drive straight through this bay window. I mean, I just shattered it. I mean, it was just a it was this big, huge thing. And the rest of that story is, is Chris and I, we went into the house, looked for the golf ball. We couldn't find the golf ball because the golf ball was in the backyard. And the only way that it could be in the backyard was, yes, it went through another window. So, like, it went through a couple of windows. But, and I'm glad no one was in the house at the time because that could have left a mark. And, um, and so we got in trouble. We got grounded. There was all kinds of things that happened from that. But over the years, Chris and I stayed really, really good friends, and um, God's call on my life started, I, it started changing for me when I was like 11 or 12 years old. I got saved, and, and I, I wanted to start doing what God was asking me to do. And when I was 13, uh, I'd been saved for probably about a grand total of eight months, and, and God came to me one night while I was laying in bed, and he said, he, and I, it was just so clear, so clear, as clear as it can be for a 13-year-old that, that I needed to start witnessing to my best friend. I need to start talking to him about Jesus. I need to start inviting him to church. and just needed to start um, um, working with him on that. And so the very next morning, I got up. I went next door, asked him if he could hang out, and we just started talking. And, and every so often, I would just plug in this, the questions about, do you believe in God? Do your parents go to church? Why don't you guys go to church? Would you want to come to church with me? Um, you know, can we read the Bible together? Can I pray for you? You know, I, so we, and so over a period of weeks, I just, started, I just started doing this, and I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. But I knew going into it how wonderful it was because um, I, I felt like the Lord was with me. And Brooke, you were talking about that uh, in, in the video this morning, and we talked about that in Sunday school. And we hear it in this passage of Scripture this morning that, that no matter what we're called to and no matter where we go, God is always with us. So after a period of weeks, um, this was about four or five years after we broke this bay window, we were out and we were just kind of sitting on his front porch and we were hanging out and we were talking. We start talking about that story. We start laughing at the fact that we shattered that window. And so we got off the front porch and we moved over into this flower bed and we were trying to, the window had been replaced, but we were trying to figure out, you know, where that ball went through that window and, and we were laughing and because, you know, at that point it was okay to laugh. And uh, we just were in the middle of that laughing. I just, it was like it hit me again. I felt like God came to me that moment. And he said, hey, he goes, I want you to ask him if he would want to pray the prayer of salvation and ask me into his heart. Oh, my goodness, I was terrified. He was my best friend. We talked about everything. We laughed about everything. We hung out all the time. And I was absolutely terrified to ask this question. So I just, I took a deep breath. I said, hey, Chris, I know we've been talking a lot about this lately. I said, would you be willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today? Just out of nowhere, just at random. I said, I know it's awkward. I know it's strange. I know it's weird. He said, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I'd like to do that. So we were in this flower bed, and I couldn't think of anything else to do, so I said, let's just kneel right here. And so we kneel at this bay window where there's a little eave, so the little eve of this bay window, where just five years earlier we were causing all kinds of problems, uh, he, he kneels and he prays for Christ to come into his life. Now, I tell you that story because I started thinking about it this week. I started thinking about that window. That window is a, a, a perfect symbol of how this process works. 
It's a perfect symbol of how salvation works. That window was absolutely destroyed. It was shattered. There was nothing left of it. I mean, it was in pieces, thousands of pieces. And it, was one, it, wasn't like a, it wasn't like a little window. I mean, it was a big window, and it was in thousands of pieces. It looked like a car accident happened in this flower bed. I mean, it was just shattered, pieces upon pieces upon pieces. And I thought as we were kneeling, I thought about this week, as we were kneeling at this brand new window, or I was, at that time it was five years old, but a window that was put back together, put back into place, clean. You can see through it. And I started thinking to myself, it's amazing how God works that way. God takes the very shattered pieces of our lives and he puts them back together so they are just like brand new. The, the incredible part about the way that God works, and I tell you that story to tell you that God's call on my life began at a very early age. And that wasn't even at the time that he called me to be a pastor. Many of you know that story. I ran from that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I ran, and it felt like forever. It was 10 years, but I ran from it forever and ever and ever because I didn't think that I was good enough. I was filled with so much fear that I would not allow God to do with me what I knew that he could. When I knew time and time again the times that God had asked me to do things and the time that I stepped forward and I got past my fear to do the things that God asked me to do, that God always came through for me. And not only did God always come through for me, God always came through for whoever he was asking me to reach out to. The story about David and Goliath is about a 15-year-old boy who's willing to, to go down to a creek to find these stones and step forward and tell his king, that he will be willing to go out and fight. There's two Goliaths in this story, though. There's the physical one. There's the physical Goliath. Uh, there's, there's the nine-foot, scary, bearded guy that's yelling out and taunting everyone, letting them know that if anyone comes his way, he's going to kill him. And all of us have physical giants in our lives. Every single person in here has a giant that they face. And you have that person in your mind. You have that situation in your mind. There is, a, there is a Goliath standing in front of you that taunts you on a daily basis. The second Goliath in this story actually wasn't the same Goliath that David was facing. The second Goliath in the story belonged to all the Israelites. The second Goliath was them. It was themselves. Think about this. David not only had to face down a nine-foot Philistine with just a slingshot and a stick, he also had to convince, walk through, and get mocked by his family. There's two Goliaths in that story. And every single Israelite that was standing there that day, standing in fear, watching this young boy walk across the field to what they thought was going to be his death, and oh, by the way, they were letting him do it, they weren't willing to get past themselves until he accomplished the impossible. So my question for you this morning is, is, is are you your own Goliath? What is keeping you from doing what God is asking you to do? What is keeping you from going to that amazing, incredible, miraculous place? Scary, yes. Unanswered questions, a ton of them. But what is keeping you from grabbing your stick and your sling and going? No matter what everybody else says, no matter, no matter what anybody else thinks, there are going to be people in your life that they're going to tell you you're wrong. There's going to be people in your life that are telling you you're not doing it right. There's going to be people in your life that says you're going to get killed if you do that. There's always going to be opposition. There's always going to be people who are going to say that they can either do it better or that, that you aren't going to be able to do it good enough. David heard it all the time through this story. And he was still willing to step forward and go because he knew that he had God on his side and that's all he needed. He knew it was more than just a sling and a stone or a musical egg. He knew there was more to it than that. 
He knew that God's call, God's purpose, God's will, God's way was going to take him through. But what if David lost? Well, more than likely, it's hard for us to know. Maybe Israel would have been, you know, motivated then at that point to go. Maybe not. But here's what I do know. If David would have lost in that moment, his life would have been pleasing to God. Because it's not about winning or losing the fight. It's about deciding to go in. It's not about winning and losing. It's not about success or failure. It's about deciding to go. No matter the cost. It's having faith and knowing that no matter how many times you mess up, do we need to go a little bit later on and talk about David? David messes up a lot. He messes up a ton, but who is he? He's the man after God's own heart. Because it's not about the su success and the failure. It's not about winning and losing. It's about the decision. It's about the decision. Church board... You guys decided some amazing things a couple of weeks ago about the building and about moving and about doing all those kind of things. And, and church, you're going to hear more about that in the next couple of weeks. But like, you've decided to do something so incredible. There's, there's going to be a lot of fun, filled, exciting, successful adventures that come from that. There are going to be times that we don't do it right and that we fail. But it's not about the successes and the failures. It's about deciding to go. It's about the decision. Those of you who accepted Christ as your personal Savior on Easter Sunday, you made some incredible decisions. Those of you who decided to get baptized, you made some incredible decisions for God. You're not always going to get it right. I don't always get it right. But it's not about the success or the failure or the winning and the losing. It's about the decision to go. David could have walked across that field Goliath could have stepped on him and squashed him like a bug, and it wouldn't have mattered to God. It would have been pleasing to God because he decided to go. But the reason God blessed David was because he decided to go. The reason that story isn't any different than what it is is because it is the story that's as old as time itself. Every time somebody steps out and does what God is asking them to do, he goes with them and he helps them. He helps them along the way. So the two Goliaths, there's physical Goliath, and then there's you as a Goliath. What is inside you that is keeping you from doing what God is asking you to do? Are you willing to step out and go today? Your lives matter. In the, in the big picture of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, the things that you decide to do for God today will echo through all of eternity. The life of David did. And we could go through Bible characters. Pastor Cheryl, you were a children's pastor for years and years and years, and you could go through Bible character after Bible character after Bible character after Bible character. We could, we could probably list a hundred people throughout the Bible who decided to go for God and the decisions they made for him have echoed through eternity. And they will echo through eternity. And you know what, folks? You are no different than the people in this book. You are no different than the people who lived their lives for Christ. If you were living your life for Christ today and you are going and you are doing what God is asking you to do, the decisions that you make will echo through eternity because there is somebody that you are going to come in contact with. There is going to be somebody that you will help lead to Christ. And just one, just one decision, just one decision to get somebody into heaven, that echoes through eternity. It changes the course 
of the kingdom of God. Every time somebody decides to accept him as their personal savior, it changes the course of history for that person because their history is now eternity. What does that have to do with David and Goliath? He just killed a big, huge guy. After that, the Israelites win. They move forward. They go and get to the place where God is wanting them to be. Everything that the prophecies had laid out had started taking place. Everything started falling into place. And it didn't always go perfect. It didn't always go right. But it went according to God's plan. And it always will. Remember, you serve a God who is the beginning, the middle, in the end. David's courage to step out changed the course of history. And it echoes into eternity because it was God's will for that day. You know, I, I, I often wondered, when David woke up that morning, did he know? Did he know that that was going to happen? When you wake up in the morning, do you know in that moment that God is about to do something for you? Do you ever think about that? I wake up some mornings and I just kind of get ready and I go. There's some mornings I get up and I think to myself, God, what are you going to do today? Some mornings I wake up and I realize that God is going to do something today, but the ultimate question that I always ask myself is, what am I going to do about it? Church, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do when God calls you. Would you stand with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, I pray that we are a church, that we live lives that are filled with your presence, that are filled with your spirit, so that we know that we can go through the day without fear. One of our passages this morning in Sunday School, Father, you reminded us not to worry about today. Because tomorrow has enough worries for itself. Or don't worry about tomorrow, because today has enough worries for itself. So, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't worry today. I pray that we would know that you are with us. Lord, we are so thankful for you. We love you so much. We're thankful for all that you do for us. Lord, we beg you, we beg you to use us, God, and help us to have the courage and the strength and the willingness to say yes. We love you, Lord. We thank you for today. We thank you for these good people. It's in your name we pray. And all God's said, amen. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. Have a wonderful day. Go in his peace this morning.